Well, hello everyone. My name is Craig Schmidt. I'm the Senior Director of Career and Professional Development. I'd like to welcome all of you here to the UC San Diego Career Services Center for our special panel presentation today. Um, this program is uh, hosted by Career Services, which is now a part of alumni and community engagement here on campus. And we're going to be focusing on the topic of creating your own job. So we've got an, a dynamic and exciting panel of UCSD alumni who are here to talk a little bit about how they did just that. They forged their own path and created their own job and their own career. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our host for the program, Ms. Leanne Kim. And uh, Leanne is really, in some ways, the ideal host for this program because she herself created her own job and her own career path when she became the founding executive director uh, for Pacific, the Pacific Arts Movement, which is a nonprofit media arts organization here in San Diego. And they, they put on a number of events. Some of you may be familiar with one of their largest, which is the annual San Diego Asian Film Festival that's attended by tens of thousands of people each year. So it's a wonderful event. Prior to that time, Leanne served for nearly 12 years as a respected news anchor and reporter uh, for the local San Diego uh, KGTV Channel 10. She's the recipient of a number of awards, including a regional Emmy Award for investigative reporting, and it's a delight to have you here. So if you could all please join me in giving a warm UC San Diego welcome to Leanne Kim. Oh, thank you. That was a very, very nice introduction, and it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I love this topic, and it's very relevant to me, being an accidental nonprofit leader. I mean, I don't think uh, anyone ever dreams of growing up to become a founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization, but you know sometimes that happens. So looking forward to this conversation with our panelists here, all in different phases of their careers. And so we're gonna start with our gen my gen gentleman here to the left of me, who's all dressed up yeah. for the event. <laughs> Um, his name is Adam Markowitz. He graduated from UC San Diego in 2008 with a degree in structural engineering. After UC San Diego, he worked as an aerospace engineer at the Space Shuttle Program for five years, designing and analyzing high energy rocket engine components. And so yes, he can say that he is a rocket scientist, right? And 2012, he launched his own company called Portfolium, which is an academic e-portfolio network, which is a complete departure from his aerospace engineering degree. And so, first of all, I wanted to welcome you, Adam, and Thanks. wanted to ask you, like, what motivated you to start your own business, especially something that is such a departure from what you studied? Sure. Um, it was actually my experience here at UCSD, especially my senior year. Um, I experienced a problem when I was looking for my first job after college. Um, and the problem was, how do I stand out to these employers and really prove myself beyond the limits of just a resume or transcript? Um, and so I came up with a solution to that problem, and the solution was a product, and that product became a company. So sort of an accidental entrepreneur. That's right. But you know, you were very successful in getting your first job right out of college at the Space Shuttle program. Yeah. But then you launched it right as soon as um, the Space Shuttle uh, retired, right? Sure, yeah. and so you were out of a job. Mm -hmm. And then you created your own. So yeah. that's wonderful. All right. Our second panelist here is um, UCSD alumna Denise Bevers, co-founder and chief operating officer of Kindred Biosciences, Inc. It's a veterinary biotech company dedicated to bringing first-in-class therapeutics to cats, dogs, and horses. And yes, she has a few cats and dogs at home as well. Now, prior to her foray into veterinary drug development, Denise spent over 20 years in human drug development development focused on clinical operations, medical affairs, and scientific communications. Following positions held at Elon Pharmaceuticals, Sky Pharma, Quintilis, Scripps Clinic, Research Foundation, and she also co-founded SD Scientific, where she now serves as a director. My goodness, your <laughs> resume is very, very long, and congratulations Thank to you. you for all of your ongoing success, Denise. Um, what kind of advice would you give to uh, college students and college graduates who want to create their own jobs, and in particular, young women? Because as we know, there are very few women who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies yes, out there. Yes, unfortunately, that is the case. I think we're changing that day by day. We're seeing more uh, women in executive positions, more women with board positions. Um, coming out of school, I think one of the important messages is it's never too late to create your own job. From the time you're in college thinking about an opportunity all the way through to the 11th hour of your career. I mean, I really think there are opportunities within, um, job, within companies themselves. You may create your own job within a company. You may um, seek out your own position, become a consultant, or start your own business. And I think there's a lot of different ways to come at that. It's either finding an unmet need, 
Um, it could be uh, finding a niche within the industry you're already in where you have experience and you're forging your own path. Um, I think for women, it's really important um, if you can reach out and find some mentors who have blazoned the trail before you. Um, we're seeing a lot of women uh, Cheryl Sandberg, for example, at Facebook, I, I think everyone's familiar with leaning in. We're starting to see a lot more women in positions of power. And I think mentorship is really important. And I think if you look at this room, how many women are in this room right now, um, your alumni association is a great place to start. And with that, I suspect a few women here might be reaching out to you for some I mentorship would, I as welcome well, Denise. It. I truly welcome it. I'm, I'm always open and, you know, it's been a long road to get to where I am and I hope to shorten that for everyone, you know, who's coming up. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Denise. And our third panelist is Henry DeVries. Can I say this? A 1979 graduate of UC San Diego and past president of the UCSD Alumni Association. He is co-founder and CEO of Indie Books International, a publisher spe specializing in business books by consultants, executive coaches, and company leaders. Henry is also the author of six books and writes a weekly Sunday career column for UT San Diego, the Metro Daily Newspaper. He was formerly assistant dean and marketing instructor at UC San Diego Extension and was president of a large San Diego advertising and public relations firm. In other words, he has a lot of spare time on his hands, right? <laughs> yeah. Henry, thank you so much for joining us. Now, I have heard you say that there is plenty of work, but not a lot of jobs. What do you mean by that? I mean, the notion of a job is going away, and it's something that's just been of recent history. Uh, 100, 150 years ago, there weren't jobs, but people had work. Um, it was almost like they were independent contractors. We've come full circle to that. So you look where there's a need, you look where there's a challenge, either within an organization or going out on your own, and you can create a job. I, I'm proud that I was here in 1979. When I, I still teach here, and when I tell that to students, most say, that's before we were born. That's right. And I say, shut up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then I go on to tell them, the first job I created was when I was a student here, I created the position of sports information director and did that half time while I finished my junior and senior year. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a serial entrepreneur, aren't you? <laughs> serial entrepreneur. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. So let's talk to Adam. Um, I suppose in, you know, in aerospace engineering while you were studying, they didn't have a lot of business management classes. So I wanted to ask you about what are some important skills um, that you need to create your own job? Um, well, you know, I, like you said, I didn't have a lot of that business background. I had an engineering background, which is pretty multifaceted. Um, it's a discipline where you have to know a lot about a lot of different things. Um, so I actually surrounded myself with people who had done the business side before, um, mentors, advisors, as early as day one. Um, and I think that played a huge role. Um, the company right now is, is based out of a, an accelerator program in downtown San Diego where we have full access to mentors and advisors. And it's, it's made a huge difference in our company and, and me as an entrepreneur, as a CEO. It's, it's been great. Mm -hmm. And what kind of skills over the last couple of years running this company do you feel like you've had to gain um, moving forward and leading the company? Leadership, like you just nailed it. Um, how to lead. Um, everyone's got their own philosophy, their own ideas. Um, I like to lead by example um, and just knowing how to motivate people. I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned um, in leadership is not everybody's motivated by the same things. So um, really knowing how to connect with people and how to motivate them is, is a big skill that I've learned. Right, because when it's your business and your job that you created, it's your baby. Exactly. So you, you know your motivation, exactly. so, right? Um, now, Denise, let me pose this question to you. You've worked at a plethora of companies before owning your own. How important is it to work at other companies before creating your own job? Mm, that's a good question. I'm a little bit biased because that was my trajectory. So. You know, in my opinion, if you, uh, again, it's never too late. You know, I was almost 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry when I started SD Scientific, and that was actually a lifestyle choice. The pharmaceutical company at, uh, where I was working, I knew was moving from San Diego up to the Bay Area. And a colleague of mine decided we really wanted to stay in San Diego. And um, we had uh, sort of specialized in an area of drug development, and we were hiring consultants and um, uh, agencies all the time and we always thought you know we could do a lot better job than these agencies or consultants so that first company really stemmed out of creating a job for myself to stay in San Diego it grew into a company but it was really um, a lifestyle choice and I will say the benefit of it was that I had so much experience already and I had this network of people that I could tap into to start the company 
So, so it certainly helps. It then. most definitely helped. I think there are many situations in emerging technologies. Again, Adam's a great example. Henry mentioned starting his first, you know, creating his first job in college. So I think there's opportunity right outside of school. But for me, I think having the background and the expertise gives a lot of opportunity to create that job of your of your own. So Henry, what do you think? You know, what kind of jobs are easiest to create? And actually, can you create a job if you don't have a lot of work experience? The easiest jobs to create are in the service industry because this is a business you can start where um, you see a need, you come in and fill it, and you don't need a lot of capital to start that. You don't need a lot of background. You need a customer. A customer is what you need to start the business. And that means a tra uh, it's a transaction that I will do this for you at this price, and is, of the, is that a value? Uh, one person I interviewed about this, he was still in college. He saw this company. They were hiring people to make phone calls. And he said, do you have a drawer of people that you used to do business with and you don't do business with anymore? And the owner said, well, yeah. He said, well, I want the job to call all those people and I'm going to ask them why they're not doing business with you anymore. And one of two things will happen. One, you'll learn a valuable lesson or two, they'll come back as a client. He said, you're hired. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. Oh. Okay, everybody write that down. <laughs> yes. Right? Okay. Um, Adam, you, you talked a little bit about how you started uh, Portfolium. You saw a problem out there. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on how you identified that problem and how you used this platform of Portfolium to solve that problem? Sure. Well, I experienced the problem firsthand. Um, I was interviewing for jobs or companies in this very career center, and I had my resume, my transcripts and I felt like I had more to show. Um, it was tough to really show my passion and skills um, using only those, those tools. Um, so I actually brought a paper portfolio into my job interview. I printed out photos of projects I had worked on, um, team projects. I always got that question in the interview. Give me an example of a team project you worked on and what did you learn from that experience? And um, having visual aid to really demonstrate what I was talking about made a huge difference and it helped me land that job on the space shuttle program. Um, so that was kind of the first beta, I guess, solution to that problem I experienced. Um, and it just ballooned from there. Do you think that the E solution will ever take away the paper solution? Um, no. I mean, we always say, you know, the portfolio is more visual enhancement or supplement to the traditional resume or even a LinkedIn profile. 30% um, of portfolio users actually have a LinkedIn, and they're actually embedding their portfolio entries right onto their LinkedIn. So enhancing what they already have, um, I think that's key. Uh, Denise, can you tell us a little bit more about Kindred Biosciences and what led you to create Kindred uh, Biosciences? And, and uh, I think this was the first job that you created? Actually, um, just before that, I created a company called SD Scientific. And Henry's point is uh, you know, right on for me because we went into a service industry. Again, I was in the pharmaceutical industry. I saw a need. I had a built-in client base because of all of our connections. Um, so that was the first company I started that just kind of stemmed out of making a job for myself. Kindred Biosciences actually also came out of that time period. About 10 years ago, a colleague of mine and I were talking about, um, we had pets. And a lot of our veterinarians were using drugs that were developed for humans um, and, and giving those. I see a lot of head shaking. So you're, you're familiar with a lot of the uh, medications that your pets received. Um, at the time, 10 years ago, the timing wasn't right because we couldn't develop drugs inexpensively enough where um, owners could pay out of pocket. So the idea sort of simmered in the background, and my partner was actually um, doing some work in Africa. This is a really fun story. He was in Africa, and they were treating people in Africa with drugs that were created for cattle. Um, they would invest in R&D for livestock, you know, but not necessarily for people in this particular region. And he called me up, and he said, I've got it. You know, we've been talking about this for 10 years. Here's the model. We're going to take drugs that have already been tested, the billions of dollars spent in human drug research, and we're going to reformulate them for cats, dogs, and horses. And we then you know, got to work. So the point of that is you may have an idea, and the timing may not be right. But you let it simmer, and you can pull some of those ideas out later on. This was a decade later. And uh, for me, it was a lot of fun because my degree is actually in ecology, behavior, and evolution from UCSD. So I took my zoology degree from you know 20 years ago and came full circle. But it took a decade to get there. You think serendipity plays a little part of it? Serendipity is yeah. huge. And that is some advice that I have for every college graduate. Take advantage of opportunity. Don't If you know in your heart of hearts that you can do a job, 
Um, don't second guess yourself. Go for it. You know, try out new things. Seek out mentors, like I said before, and really embrace any opportunity. Mm, that's a fabulous story. Yeah. Thank you so fun. much for that. Henry, same question. Um, and on the sidebar, like you and I are old school, right? In right. terms of books, we love books. We love to read, and I love to smell and feel the books, right? But that is um, changing a bit. So I wanted to ask you about creating indie books in, uh, international. Especially in this digital age, isn't print dead or is that just a saying? Or is print dying? Um, six years ago, there were six million books, six million titles available for sale on Amazon.com. Today, there are 32 million titles. Mm -hmm. The digital revolution is creating a book revolution. But many people are bringing books out in print, so old school people like us can can read them. You know, they're a great device. They don't need any electricity. Uh, you know, they're portable. They contain all these bits of information. Uh, so they're still there. But also the electronic version with Kindle and all these is really promoting people to get into reading. So what we're really about is helping coaches and consultants create a book that will help them attract clients, put money in the, in the bank, and then help them make a difference in the world that they really want to make. So that's what we're all about. Mm, wonderful. And also, if you are reading a book and you drop it in the tub, it won't fizzle out, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. OK. Thanks, Henry. Um, Denise, do you think that everyone has the ability to start their own business? Or do you think that there are certain people who are just not meant to start their own jobs? I think. You know, it takes a lot of perseverance and tenacity, and you have to really believe in your idea. I mean, you're going to get a lot of no's, you know, particularly if you're doing something unique. Um, you may have naysayers in your family, you know, who think, oh, no, you have to work for a corporation. That's the ultimate goal. So it really, I think, depends on the individual. But I think um, not giving up, I think doing your homework, you know, if you can be your own devil's advocate or talk to people you trust about this job that you want to start, it helps you to really think through it. And then when you do decide to go out on your own, you've thought through a lot of the uh, issues and rewards. So I think there's homework involved. And I think having the right idea and tenacity to see it through. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, finding a problem and then addressing the problem through um, starting your own job. But then there's that piece of like having the idea and actually, you know, jumping in and diving in. And that must have been pretty scary for you coming from a very, you know, right out of school, five years out of school, working for the space shuttle program and then deciding, oh, my gosh, I'm going to go in on this myself. Um, can you give some advice on how to make that decision? <laughs> Uh, and or yeah. at least share your process. Sure. I mean, they call it taking the plunge. Um, and every entrepreneur has to do it at some point. Mm. Um, you know, me, I think I had an advantage because I was young. I'd only been working for five years. Um, it ultimately came down to, if I'm going to do this, I better do it now. Um, some people don't have that luxury. So you know, I was fortunate in that way. Um, but it can be, it can, if you're at a company, it can get really comfortable. Um, not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting to really take the plunge, especially leaving a comfortable salary. Um, so you have to really decide if it's something that you want to do. Because if you do it, and then you get naysayers, and you've got to have a thick skin, and not too thick, I mean, it's yeah. there's a lot to consider. But Well, and you have to be comfortable. You have to be friends almost with risk taking, yeah. right? And also be friends with failure as well. Yeah, and just chalk it up to a learning experience. Um, because I think you, you, know, you learn more from your failures than you do your success. Was it smooth sailing um, between the time that you took the plunge? Or was there a few ups and downs before it actually took off? Um, it's always up and down. It's a roller coaster, um, at least in my experience, um, minute to minute, hour to hour. Um, so. But it's fun. I mean, that's, that's a big piece of it. You have to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation for most people, um, at least yeah, in my situation. Well, you're in the early part of your career, and Denise and Henry are in the latter part of their careers. But you both were shaking your head, understanding that time and taking the plunge. Can you both each share a story about taking the plunge on your end? On mine, every day, I say to myself, be brave. It's this little mantra that I'm repeating over and over again. And what it means is I laid out all these choices and plans, and it takes courage to keep being the one who says, OK, now we're going to do this. Now we're going to go to London and put on a seminar when we know no one there. 
and, and see how that works. Now we're going to try to get into this line of business. And um, a lot of times you have to make what's called the entrepreneur speech when you're running a company. <laughs> so it's uh, why you're getting people to come join you and follow you when logic would tell them that they should not do this. Uh, but more people are convinced by your courage and enthusiasm and excitement than they are by the logic of the business yeah. plan. I think that's very true. For my first uh, job that I created for myself, it was very safe. You know, I literally left Elan Pharmaceuticals on a Friday, and on Sunday I was on a plane to my first client because, again, I had that network, you know, of industry experience. For Kindred Bio, I will tell you it's been very different. Um, you know, I um, we took the company public, which was this huge leap. I mean, talk about taking a plunge. You know, and there are days where I'm really melancholy for being private. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was an enormous plunge, and it's been so rewarding but it's been up and down hour to hour day to day and you know the great thing for me is I truly believe in the company and I think that has a lot to do with it you know and, and you can bring people on with your own enthusiasm and your own belief in your job or your company so I hear from from each of you it's a state of mind Definitely. it's very very mental right about having the courage absolutely jumping in and believing in yourself Right. I'm sure our audience members have a few questions so we're gonna just take a short break and come back with some questions from our audience all right, we're back. And we have a lot of really good questions from our audience. Uh, one of them is the question of entrepreneurship versus intrapreneurship. Um, being an entrepreneur within one's company, right, or where, wherever they work. I was wondering if any of the panels had any thoughts on, on that particular topic. Well, that's how I started all this. I didn't really become, I think, an entrepreneur till. 15 years ago. Prior to that, I was always within a company. And for instance, I was in an advertising and PR agency. How you make a living is you're assigned a certain number of accounts to manage. You're an account executive. Uh, well, I went to the president and said, in addition to that job, I'd like to create a second job here. I'd like to be the director of research. And she says, well, how would that work? And I said, well, I think all of our clients could benefit from research projects that we could lead and that would increase billings, but it would also improve our product for them. So she agreed and we helped double billings in that agency from five million to 10 million in five years through that strategy. So uh, I was like, a, in addition to my work, I was also a free, freelance rover and just finding opportunity. And, and usually I would get people started about well, what's the challenge at the business? And that's where the money is. I know another man, he was interesting. He was a consultant and he was getting management consulting projects in the thirty-five to $50,000 range. He was a sole entrepreneur. He had no staff. He never bid projects versus other consultants. Here's how he did it. He found out everybody was using a program called salesforce.com and they were frustrated. So he learned everything he could about it and then he would go around to companies and say, I, I'm a salesforce.com expert and for $5,000 I can come in and train all your people. Smart. And I'll be on site for a month to do this. And they said, great. When he was there, all the talk would be about, well, what's going wrong at the company? And then he'd go to the executives and say, oh, by the way, I've heard you've been having a problem with this. They said, well, that's right. Would you like a proposal on how to fix that? Oh, we'd love that. He, we called it the camel nose under the tent strategy. <laughs> uh, so that there's a, I think a proverb that if you let a camel get its nose under the tent, you wake up sleeping next to a camel in the morning. So if you give them a little, they take a lot. Um, so this is sort of a, a subtle way that they got in and created his own job at company after company after company. Keeping your eyes, ears, and your nose open to there opportunities, you go. right? The nose knows. Denise? I love, I mean, I love the idea of entrepreneurship, and I think it's a real opportunity for people at a corporation. I mean, keep your eyes open and listen and participate in as many meetings. And don't forget that people love to talk about themselves. So don't hesitate to seek out someone and say, hey, you work in this area. What's it like? Tell me about the job. How did you get here? I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to, one, create a job, as Henry described, but but also to move within a job or maybe merge different departments or find your own niche and um, really take advantage of talking to people and being participative. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of bosses or owners would appreciate knowing that one of their employees is actually thinking about how to solve problems. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it could be a good way to even vet a company as a new employee if you go to your boss and in a sense they're looking for a way to overachieve or, or do more than was expected and, and they turn down the idea. I think that's a giant red flag um, for that company and the group 
group that you're working in. It's yeah. funny, I, I'm doing performance evaluations this week and I actually had someone who blindsided me today, he's in one role, and told me that his interests are completely, I mean, something that I would never have even thought. And I said, well, I'm so glad you told me because I would have had absolutely no idea, but now we're figuring out a path to have him, you know, sort of move over that way. And so you, absolutely, I think it's the culture of the company is really important. And if you find yourself in a company where that's not welcome, you should think about if, you know, if that's where you want to be. Well, there's a, a question from the audience where, how can you be entrepreneurial if that's not part of your personality? Right, because what you're talking about is, you know, putting yourself out there and having the courage to speak up or, you know, talk with your bosses and hobnob and all of that. But if that's not part of your, part of your personality, how can you be entrepreneurial in a situation like that? Can I give pushback? Sure. What do you really care about doing? And what are you willing to do to make that happen? We had a great speaker come in, a man by the name of Van Jones wrote a book about the green economy and green jobs. And he asked our students, how many people here would like to have a green job? And the hands went up. He said, you're gonna have to create your own. <laughs> so if you care about it, you're gonna have to figure out a way where you're creating a company that is um, turning businesses and homes into more sustainable environments and offer that to people. So if you really care about that, if you have the passion about that, then you can figure out these other things about marketing and sales and accounting and all those other things. Yeah, none of us were born, you know, loving to do all that. Um, but it's what are you passionate about and what are you willing to learn to do it? And that's, I mean, UCSD, what we learned here was how to learn. Mm. Well, and we have a question here about passion to uh, coattail off of that. How do you know when you should take passion to the next level or if it's better just as a hobby? <laughs> I think that's a really good question because I think we all want to take passion to the next level if we can. But I think, again, doing your homework um, and thinking about the positives and the negatives. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting is um, probably like Henry, I, you know, I interact with a lot of entrepreneurs who are in their later stages of their career. And I've seen many completely abandon the career trajectory to do something they've been passionate about. You know, financially, they're in a position to do it. So again, when I say it's never too late and you can foster your passion, you may not create a job at the time that you're in your earning years or you need to do something, but it's never too late to you know, seek out a passion when the time is right. Did you ever think that your job, uh, this you know, uh, portfolio might be just a, a side job or a hobby rather than your main job? Yeah, I mean, it started as just me doing something for myself. I shared it with friends and family and it started working for them. Um, and that's kind of when the light bulb went off. You know, this wasn't just a one-off. This wasn't just something for me. Um, and that's when I became really passionate about it, especially as people started thanking me because I gave them something that they didn't think of themselves. Um, I wanted to continue that feeling of that good, warm, fuzzy feeling of helping people. But there's a little bit more to it than that. I mean, to launch your own job, you do need a little bit of financing. So one of the questions from the audience was, how did you finance your startup or your own job? Out of my own pocket. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the beginning, especially, um, I got some great advice um, from early advisors saying, especially before I took the plunge, it was, you know, if you're not willing to take the plunge on your own idea, why would an investor give you money? Um, which sounds so simple and easy to understand, but it didn't cross my mind at the time. Um, so I took the plunge and started funding it out of my own pocket for quite some time, um, which really proves passion doesn't guarantee that people are gonna follow. Um, you still have to follow through, but um, it does, does say a lot. But you had, was it savings or did you take a loan out or was it a mixture of both? And then also how did you figure out how much you need, right? In my case, it was saving. So I had worked for five years after UCSD. I had done a good job of saving, um, and I could have used that money to do a lot of different things, <laughs> um, but I decided to invest in myself. For you. Yeah, for me, it was um, just what Henry talked about earlier, that my first job that I created for myself was a service provider. So there, you, I really didn't have to raise much capital in the beginning, and I had done my homework and lined up you know, business before I took the plunge, leaving a very successful job in, f in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, for Kindred Bio, we very much had to raise some funds, but our idea was so solid, and it, we had such a solid business plan in the sense that it made sense to people. People know what people spend on their pets. You know, they know that pets need medicine and should have the same type of medical care that we have. And so it was a very um, easy business plan, and so it was, we raised money uh, early on. Yeah. So for my first company, I was surprised to learn 
This was 16 years ago. I formed a company called the New Client Marketing Institute, and it was a sales training company for consultants on how to get clients. And when I started, people kept coming up to me, congratulating me on starting a business. And what I kept thinking was, you too could cash in your 401k. Because <laughs> that's what I have done. Congratulations. Yeah. And if you talk about the entrepreneurial speech, the speech I've had to make to my wife <laughs> for the last 35 years, uh, she's been, and she's risk averse, but she knows she married this crazy person. Um, <laughs> This recent company dipped into my pocket savings, but then also found investors. Um, so you can do that. At one point with the last company, um, a client was giving us pushback on, on their payment and their terms. And I said, well, I've, I've really talked to our investors and uh, this is, we have to ask for the cash up front. So they agreed. And the person left the room, my daughter, who, who still works for me, works in the company, and she was 16 at the time. And she said, Dad, are investors? And I said, yeah, MasterCard, Visa, <laughs> American Express. Our investors want money this month. So you know, that's, that, and that's how we, sometimes you do it with credit card if you have to. Mm. And it's that wit factor, whatever it takes, especially when you're creating your own job, you're married to it because it's your baby. And when I say married to it, I'm sure that you've spent you know, more than eight hour days, right? Launching and maintaining and sustaining. One of the great questions is how do you uh, balance a personal life? Because there, certainly there must be some sacrifices. And here, I mean, I, I'd love for you to be honest because while there are some upsides to being your own boss, there should be some, there, there must be some downsides as well. Yes. Yeah, I, I heard the word in there, sacrifice. Um, yeah, everyone has their own level of sacrifice that they're willing to, to put in. and some more than others and I think that goes into the mindset of if, it's, if you're cut out for it or if it's something you should pursue because you sacrifice quite a bit, or I have personally. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's... Well, tell it's, us what you sacrificed. Time, uh, time with friends, family, my puppy. Aww. Um, <laughs> Who cares about the friends? It's all about the puppy, it's like puppy. Right? Now I have a puppy at home, I gotta get home. Um, the puppy can sit on your lap while you're working. Yeah, I mean, the financial it. aspect is, is a huge piece of it. I mean, that's a giant sacrifice, but all the other little things that you don't maybe think about. Um, Relationships, it oh, sounds like. Absolutely. Oh, it's, it's like yeah. having someone that can right. understand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, I, you know, my husband and I actually talked about Kindred Bio before I started it because I knew what I was getting into. Well, I, I should say, I thought I knew what I was getting into until mm, I got into mm, it. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I struggle with it. I mean, I struggle with the work life balance. I've, um, read a lot of really great books and they all make sense up here, you know, that I would be a more productive executive were I to take time or go to yoga or, you know, the, the company's not going to fall apart if I take the night off. Um, so I have to say I'm working on it and as many years as I've been doing this, I still struggle with it. So there are definitely sacrifices. I think knowing that your network is in it with you is really important. Um, and uh, if they're not and you just really believe in your idea, I think you can bring them along with your you know, uh, happiness in doing what you're doing. I've always believed in having business coaches and advisory boards. Um, and they, they hold your feet to the fire on a lot of things and, and you need to empower them to ask you the tough questions. And my current advisory board is demanding that I not work seven days a week mm -hmm. because we're in this for the long run. Uh, but some of it, you're so passionate about what you're doing, and if I could just do this more, and if I could land this, and, and there's this we have to work on, um, you love it. But if you lose sight of the relationships, your health, your family, it's an epic fail. I guess the puppy is on your advisory board, right? Oh, definitely. Don't work seven days a week. You've got to take me out a exactly. couple of times, right? All right, uh, another question from our audience is, how do you deal with the expert complex, feeling like you have to know everything? I'll start with you, Adam. <laughs> because you do know everything, I right? Was, I was gonna preface yeah. my answer with, yeah, I don't even have the right answer for that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then you I, just turn to the other expert, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I try to surround myself with people who are experts. Um, advisory panels um, are great because you don't have to be the expert in everything. Is there a complex, though, that you feel like as the CEO or the, you know, the owner of your own job that people look to you and there's that, that expectation that you do know everything? I think, you know, in my 
situation where I've not just created a job for myself. You know, when I did just create a job for myself, I very much had that angst about knowing everything. And I did have a network to tap into. With the company, I think you make a much better leader if you, you know, really try to hire the best talent. I mean, that's going to make you a success. And I think people really admire when you don't have all the answers, but you say, I have this expert over here, or I'll consult with somebody else and surround yourself with a lot of talent. I mean, that's really some advice that I would give to everyone, um, whether you're doing a job on your own or if you're starting a business. Mm -hmm. There is this tendency when you get started that you feel like you're a poser or, uh, uh, you know, they're like, oh, they're all looking to me and they think I have the answers and I don't have the answers. Like you said, I don't even have the questions sometimes, you know. Does that go away, Henry, where you don't feel like a poser? Because I, I always think if somebody you, figures well, you just out. just take it to the next level. You went there and now, now you've got stockholders that you have to think like, they think I have all the answers. And I mean, it goes all the way probably up to Warren Buffett, Absolutely. where people think he has all the answers and he doesn't have all the answers. Um, but going all the way back to Henry Ford, Henry Ford said, um, I don't have all the answers, but I know where to find the experts with the answers. So knowing where to find the knowledge is better than pretending you have the knowledge. Right. Yes. Being self-aware and, and being honest with yourself to find those kind of experts. So it, it, there's so much pressure, right, to, be, um, to have your own job um, and so much pressure to be the one everyone looks to um, to motivate others and inspire others. So I wanted to ask each one of you, where do you find your own inspiration? What inspires you? I say that I'm always my toughest critic. I don't think anyone can motivate me as much as I can myself. Um, I think that was just something I was brought up with because um, I have, you know, it wasn't like a family pressure or anything. Um, so yeah, I think it's just internal with me. I mean, everyone's different. And when I hire someone, um, I ask them what's going to motivate them because this is going to be very hard. <laughs> There's going to be difficult times, long nights. you know. And sometimes I don't even ask them to tell me what it is that motivates them. I just need to know that they have something that motivates them um, because everyone's motivated by different things. So it's you yourself putting the pressure on yourself that inspires you to, to work hard? Yeah, in a sense. I mean, just Or just the idea of success, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone has got their own definition of success. As Correct. Also, so. Correct. Yeah, I think it's an interesting um, situation because I think if you start your own job as an N of one, if you're a consultant, um, if you rise to a certain level of success, you know, you don't necessarily have someone who's helping you along and helping you to be motivated. You have to be self-motivated, but you really have to make an effort to seek out um, things that inspire and motivate you. It might not even be in the job you're in, but going to listen to a lecture, you know, on somebody, going to see the Dalai Lama speak, or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get motivation um, to do the job you're doing. And, you know, I, I mean, with Henry, you know, I read a lot of consultant books. I read a lot of books by experts in the field. Yeah, I we think, love you for it. Well, and I, I am probably one of your best customers because I'm voraciously reading, you know, to see like, well, how did Sheryl Sandberg do it? How did she balance it? You know, and that motivates me. I think, okay, it can be done. So it's funny on the motivation because um, I, I had a business plan and I was really a company of one, but we outsourced a lot of things. And an advisor looked at it and said, well, where is the salesperson's commission? And I said, well, there's no salesperson's commission. I'm the owner and I sell and I do it. And he says, oh, okay. So the salesman's gonna be motivated uh, because he gets nothing. And then the person who's gonna really have to do the work is also that person. I said, oh, okay, I see the problem. He said, what do you, what do you want? I said, you know, if, if you had, but the commission was like $1,000, what would you really want? I said, well, it's crazy. He said, tell me what it is. He said, I said, it would be a, a model train set in our house. Our children are all grown. You know, it's for me. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, how about if you hit the ambitious goal in the first quarter, you get the train set. Well, I had to bring the home, uh, the, the plan home to the CFO of the company, <laughs> Mrs. DeVries. <laughs> and she says, what's this line item for, you know, sales commission? And I gave her the whole story. She says, what would you buy with a thousand dollars? I said, a train set. She said, you can have it on two conditions. One, it must be in our dining room so everyone who comes over can see it. And two, it has to have a Disney theme. So how long did it take me to make my first quarter sales goal? 15 days, because I was going to get a train set. Uh, another CEO said, told me, you know, what else? You, I want this jacket. 
Well, if you hit a certain number, buy yourself that jacket. So sometimes you have to even put little incentives for you. The other thought I wanted to share was also about this idea of it's other people you're motivating. And somebody gave me advice once that you have to be the happy man or the happy woman. When, when the drug trial didn't go well or the funding got pulled out or when you lose the Bixby contract, you can't be down because everybody's looking to you and taking a, a cue. So you have to be up there. And I got sent home one day. Uh, so till you come back as the happy man, you know, we don't need you around here. That's because you set the tone. Oftentimes we set the pace, absolutely. right? And our energy exudes, yes, you know, our energy exudes. People kind of can pick up on if you're having a bad day, right. right? Or if you're having a good day and it kind of bleeds down. You know how they say it comes down from the top, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is, um, I, I saw something on TEDx about the golden circle, the, the golden circle. And it boils down to, when we're doing our work, you know, we're always, we're all oftentimes focused on how are we gonna do it, what are we doing, who's gonna do it with us, and we often forget about the why. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we just need to check back in because the why is very emotional. Everything else is very non-emotional. Um, and to me, for me as a nonprofit leader, yes. it's sometimes why is the easiest thing to forget is why am I doing this? And sometimes when we check back in and realize that the why is not really aligned with what you're doing anymore, it's time to move on. Yeah, I think that's a right. really good point because, you know, for us as a company, it's it's easy for, it, the why is very simple, but we forget it all the time. And, and as my, the CEO, myself, we spend a lot of time with our staff saying, you know, don't forget, you know, we're developing drugs for cats, dogs, and horses. That's why we're doing it. You know, yes, a drug trial may have failed, but that's okay, we're moving on, we're gonna do the next one, you know, and we're, we're in it for the long haul. But I think individually and then also as a company, it's easy to forget the why. Mm -hmm. so and I'm sure advice. for you, it just makes you so happy to see that student get that first job, I right? I say, we have a constant reminder of the why. We have like our Hall of Fame where students will email us, send us a photo of them on, you know, on the job at their new company and it's, we put it right on the wall. And, when things get tough, we'll look at it, and there you go, there's the why. And even prouder when they're from UCSD, right? Of course. <laughs> of course, <laughs> right? Okay, another question, um, and this is a really good one, and it's so basic. So um, think about maybe like your first two, uh, top two or three recommendations. What would you recommend to students who have an idea, but they really don't know where to start? So what are the top three things that they need to do to take that idea to fruition to the next stage? At UCSD, they could go to the basement, um, <laughs> the, new, the new accelerator program that's opening. And that's what I did. I, mm. I joined an accelerator program, and mm -hmm. it's exactly what I needed. So. Mm -hmm. That was one. Do you have two and three? <laughs> two. No, I'll let it go down. Okay, all right. I'll do two. You can do three <laughs> okay. and four, five and six. Um, I, yeah, I, th I think doing your homework. You know, I think doing your homework and trying to reach out to people and, uh, and, and other, even, you know, shadowing other people or companies and really trying to, you know, learn as much as you can before you take the plunge. And take business courses. Mm. Um, a lot of times we're expert in our area, uh, but we need to branch out. And either through extension, we offer courses in business. There's also the community colleges. So get some of the business training too to go along with your technical expertise and or passion or interest in this device. Because it still, at the end of the day, has to be a business. It's very good advice. Denise, I, I wanted to ask you in particular about, we, we talked earlier about being a woman. Yes. You know, um, CEO, and you see many women here in the audience. Um, uh, what's the hope out there, and, and what is what does the field look like? I mean, you, you said that you had, you know, you've gone public. Yes. You've been on Wall Street, um, and you probably have a network of um, other women who are CEOs. Is there hope? Yeah, <laughs> because the numbers don't really. You I know, have to tell you, you know, disparity. I ride a roller coaster because sometimes I'm really hopeful. You know, I, I get inspired by other female executives. Um, I, I do participate in some networks, both in the Silicon Valley and here in San Diego. Um, I will tell you when we went public and. Um, I did about eight or 10 meetings a day for eight days, so you can do the math. And uh, literally there were four women total who were at the table as decision makers on Wall Street. That was, I, I mean, I was shocked because, you know, in my field, in biotech, there are a lot of women. There are not as many women executives or board members as I certainly would like to see, but it is an open field. But then you go somewhere else and you think, wow, this is really a predominantly male-driven field and how do we break the barrier? So I think, 
every person like myself, like a lot of these women in the room, you know, the more we can do and the more that we can look to those who have cracked, you know, put some cracks in the glass ceiling, the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then let's talk about intergenerational creating your own job. So um, you're at the beginning of your career again. And um, do you feel that there are struggles that you face that are very specific to you because you are younger versus, you know, more being more experienced? I think the credibility aspect, just being young and dressing like this. Um, <laughs> Which is your choice, because you you're the choice. boss, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> I think that can, that can go against you as a young entrepreneur. Um, but again, surrounding yourself with smart, more experienced people who have the business side of the business experience, um, and carrying yourself, of course, in a certain way, and, and proving by what you're actually doing. Um, past success can actually help you, so um, I think that's how I've been able to overcome some of that. Is there ever an age where you're too old to start your own job? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, I really don't think so. And I, and I think it depends on the sector. I mean, I have to be honest, if I came in as a nearly 50-year-old woman in you know, software, it's, you know, you're going to do better because people expect younger people to be on the pulse you know, of what's hip and who's going to create the next platform or the next um, app. But I think in certain industries, seasoned experience is very valuable. And people expect that and have more comfort. So I think it really depends on the job you're trying to create, the sector that you're in. But I can sit here for another hour and tell you stories of people who actually really truly started their career at 60 wow. or even 70. I've met people who you know, have had a passion their whole life and finally took the plunge. The classic story is Harlan Sanders, Colonel Sanders didn't no, start absolutely. Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was 65. That's right. Ray Kroc didn't mm -hmm. start McDonald's till he was 55. Yes. Um, so there's a lot that can be done. I love the new book, Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager, uh, has coming out. It's called Refire, Don't Retire. Mm. And I think baby boomers have rewritten the rules through each generation that they've come through, and they're rewriting the rules now. Um, and when people call me and they say, oh, you know, I'm over 55 or I'm over 60, I'm having a hard time uh, getting a job, I tell them, create a job. Mm -hmm. There's people who want what you can offer. They will pay for it. Um, and it's easier to get clients and customers than it is to convince some hiring manager to invest in you. Mm. And that's a good point because people are having to work longer. I mean, you're finding people who are getting retired out of the sector they're in and, and they have to do something. And right. so sometimes the only option is to create your own job. So again, it's really never too late, but uh, dependent upon the sector. But there's one question um, about, even though it's never too late, is there a, um, a better time in your career to take the plunge? Then, then I mean, I think it depends on what you're doing. I mean, I, th I don't think you can become an expert in certain areas unless you've had some experience there. You know, I think there's, I think digital, you know, emerging digital media and things like that, a lot of people can have opportunity early on. So I think it really depends on the sort of career specific area that you're in. For me, I think the 40s and the 50s and the 60s are the best time to do it. I think you should invest in getting some time uh, we think. and seeing how other people do it. Yeah, it's starting from the ground up. Because it's the only time we have. No. <laughs> I, I really think that there's a, a lot of the literature says how, uh, especially the years in your 50s, and can be the most productive time because you've gained a lot of experience, wisdom. Sometimes that's code word for being old, but you've gained wisdom and you can apply it now. And uh, there are certain people who would like that. And, um, you know, talk about re not being able to retire. There's a story that we'll all be drinking lemonade at the rest home. Some will be sipping it on the porch and the others of us will be making it and sipping it in the back room. You know, what do you want to do? Because we're going to have to take care of each other. The boomers are, you know, three days a week, you're going to need to work at the golf course so I can go golfing. Uh, then we'll switch off. So there's, there's lots of opportunities. Can I have each of the panelists um, define for your, what stability means to you? And when you are um, your own boss or have you created your own job, is there such a thing as 100% stability? I don't know. <laughs> You're not there yet. I haven't reached yet. it yet, so, right. yeah. I don't know. I haven't reached it yet either. No, no you, I mean, it's a really good point because you always feel on the edge, especially when you're responsible for your own salary. And, 
You know, I think the times are changing though. I, you know, when you used to get a job and you know you'd stay there for 20 or 30 years, I mean, those days are gone. I mean, companies aren't loyal to you any more than people are loyal to companies these days. So for me personally, I've actually had more job security in creating jobs for myself than I had in the 20 years prior, always feeling like there could be layoffs, there could be mergers, there could be acquisitions, you know, this might be over like that. Um, so stability is, I think it's pretty non-existent for the entrepreneur, but you, you know, you try to be smart, you try to sock it away and, and have money for the downtimes. I think the average is four jobs at, or four different companies before 25. Yeah, right exactly. Now. So. Yeah. Those are like your graduate years, though. You're learning and all that, but mm -hmm. somewhere you want to get into your groove and, and do that. But I've seen people who it really worked against them, who spent 20 years at the same company. Mm -hmm. Then when they wanted to start something or go in the market, they weren't as interesting to, people, uh, to, to others yes. than the people who had been at several places and had learned along the way. Well, that's a great point, because culturally things are changing. When I look at a resume now, and I see that someone's been, I think, oh, they've been set in their ways at the same company for 20 years versus someone who's had all this experience. Very interesting. It's a really good point. And for the service industry that you mentioned, you know, again, 20 years I spent, you know, in the industry, but I learned more as a consultant because I worked with all different companies. So in a year as a consultant, I probably gained more knowledge and experience than I did for five or 10 years at one company. That's interesting because I think um, sometimes employers might look at somebody who's jumped around a lot as someone who is not loyal, right? Or somebody who can't stay or gets the two year itch. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? I think it's changing. Again, I think, you know, my expectations when I look at a CV are very different than they were even five years ago. Interesting. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, companies are selling off their programs or they're merging or they're acquiring other companies. So I think the whole corporate um, infrastructure has changed a lot, so the expectations of, you know, oh God, I've got to be at a company for five years or ten years are, is going away. But you don't want somebody who jumps by choice. You know, you have to balance out why they've moved around so much. Okay. Like a two every two year flip flop is not a good sign. Not a good sign. Four to five mm -hmm. years and moving on, that looks great. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's wrap up this panel, and I'm gonna start with you, Henry, so you have some time to think about this. Um, if you could share with us um, anything that was profound or the best um, career advice that you've ever received. The best career advice I ever received was to keep growing and keep learning. And think of yourself as a freelancer, and a freelance was a knight in the Middle Ages who did not lo owe loyalty to any king or queen, but would be available if they thought the cause was right and the money was right too. So that notion where even if you're working for somebody, don't think you're gonna be there forever. Take on assignments that'll make yourself more valuable. That'll give you options. Job security is an illusion at best. That's great advice. I enjoyed that. Uh, I think for me, um, it was really along those lines to take every opportunity, but also to really trust that just because you may not check off all the boxes on a job description, if you know in your gut that you can do it or you know you can do it better than someone else, you know, go for it. And I think, you know, you brought up the, uh, the notion of, you know, sort of being a poser. I mean, I think everyone feels that way no matter where you are. And I can tell you that the person that you admire probably goes home at night and thinks, gosh, wait till they find out I really don't, you know, I don't have this mastered because nobody does. So believe in yourself, um, believe in serendipity, you know, things present themselves and, you know, feel free to take the plunge even within a company um, and, and really be open to opportunity. Um, for me, my career plan has ended up nothing like what I would have thought when I was here at UCSD. Absolutely nothing like what I would have envisioned, but it was all from, you know, just taking opportunity that was in front of me. Yeah, you can never write the movie script. That's right. You know. And Adam. I got a good advice from my dad. I mean, he's in his late 50s, and he told me that he feels like he's never had to work a day in his life. He says, it's very cliche, but do something you love and you'll never have to work. Um, so that's kind of my little mantra. And what better place to do that? than in San Diego, California, no right? No kidding. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. um, audience, let's uh, thank our panelists here, Adam, Denise, and Henry. <laughs> this was enlightening, informative, and very inspirational. Thank you so very much, and we wish you the best on your continued careers. And on behalf of UCSD Careers, uh, Career Services Center, um, we thank you so much for joining us.